A few weeks ago, a woman slipped into the pew in front of me alone just a few minutes before the worship service began. I had not seen her before that I remembered, although where I worship, it is not uncommon to see someone who has Down syndrome. As the service began, we sat up, uh, stood up, and together we sang the hymn that we opened our service with this morning, Fairest Lord Jesus, Ruler of all nature, Son of God and Son of Man. So we came to the end of the first stanza. She put her worship folder down a little impatiently, as if somehow it might be in the way. And she proceeded to sing the rest of the hymn from memory and also to express its words through gestures using American Sign Language. It wasn't enough for her simply to sing. She wanted her whole person to engage in the act of worship. And since I was standing right behind her, I could see the hymn lived out. I, I entered into the spirit of the words of the hymn. I, I felt myself walking in those fair meadows and woodlands. I was standing under the twinkling starry host. And most of all, I could see the face of my beautiful Savior, Jesus Christ, whose hands were pierced for my transgressions. And as I watched this woman worship, I had the unmistakable sense that she was deeply in love. There was a radiance to her face. There was a beauty and grace to the gestures with which she worshiped. Jesus Christ was the predominant passion of her life. She was not disabled, as some would say, but divinely empowered for the worship of her creator. Nor was she single, as I had assumed, but truly engaged to be married. For the beauty of her worship came from a heart that was betrothed to the Son of God. And I believe this is the relationship that God wants to have with every one of us, the relationship he wants to have with me and with you, male or female, married or single. He wants an exclusive relationship like the affection a bride has for the man she is preparing to marry, with the security that comes from a groom who promises to be faithful unto death. And I think one of the best places to see that kind of relationship is in the Bible's most famous love song. And so this year I want to speak with you about the love of loves from the Song of Songs. Now, admittedly, there are easier books to preach. <laughs> it's hard to know exactly how to connect its message with the life of King Solomon. We'll be talking about that next time. He may or may not be its author. It's certainly true that he's mentioned in the first verse. The Song of Songs, as you may know, is unashamed to talk about human sexuality, which is embarrassing to some Christians. And then there is the vexing question of how to relate the book's human relationship to the love that God wants to share with his people. Those are only some of the problems, so why did I decide to do this, you might ask. I have wanted to preach this book for a long time. One of the first sermons I ever preached came from chapter 2, I am my beloved's and he is mine. He brought me to the banqueting house. His banner over me is love. What beautiful language. But I got more serious several years ago now when I visited the famous Bodmer Library on the shores of Lake Geneva in Switzerland. The Bodmer boasts one of the world's most amazing collections of ancient religious texts, biblical manuscripts, other famous books. It's perhaps the best place in the world to see the whole religious and intellectual history of humanity. And I was captivated by a stunning manuscript of the Song of Solomon from the early Med Middle Ages, maybe the seventh century, I, I can't recall precisely. The colored hand lettering of the manuscript was beautiful, but what really captured my attention was all of the white space around the text. 
It had obviously been copied by someone who knew how to read poetry. The words weren't crammed onto the page the way they are in most of our Bibles, but were allowed to breathe. The scribe wanted each line of love poetry to be savored before moving on to the next. And seeing that poem written out as a poem awakened my desire to preach it. Then last year, I read the manuscript for a new commentary on the Song of Songs by my friend Ian Duguid, who studied at Cambridge and was our pastor at Oxford. And he has an exceptional ability to understand the Old Testament in connection to Christ and then apply its gospel message for everyday Christianity. And every, with every page I read, my desire was growing to teach this book. I believe our campus needs the Song of Songs, and I believe our culture does as well. I often have students ask me for more guidance in understanding human sexuality, not just looking for a kind of list of biblical do's and don'ts, although that may have its place, but wanting to understand God's stunning design and higher purpose for our relationships. We live in a world where sexuality is ruined by sin, and its beauty in so many ways is obscured by our brokenness. Would it not be good for us to have a divine vision of sex the way that it was meant to be, with a gospel that offers forgiveness for sexual sin and an empowering grace to live into the sexuality that God wants to give us? And would it not also be good for us to have relationships that are rightly ordered the way the Holy Spirit wants us to have them? Well, I find one of the best ways to capture, maybe the best, I think it is the best, the best way to capture God's vision about anything is simply to work through some of the Bible and then let God's Spirit set the agenda through Scripture. And what we find when we turn to the Song of Songs is a love story told in the form of a love song that is set within the greatest love story ever told. What I want to do for us this morning is try to set the Song of Songs into its wider context. I want to say at the beginning, I don't intend to treat this book as an allegory in which everything in the book stands for something else and then we start coming up with meanings that the author never intended. But I do want to be faithful to God's purposes for marriage and romance, which the Bible consistently regards as mysteries that point beyond themselves to God's everlasting love. Whenever we talk about the way a husband loves his wife, we're never just talking about marriage, but always about Christ's great love for the church. The Bible brings this metaphor before us again and again as a pattern for God's love relationship with his people. And the Song of Songs is part of that pattern and it becomes so by putting romance into poetry and song. You might think of this book as the soundtrack for your love relationship with your Savior. If we look at the wider story, it begins with the first man and the first woman, Adam and Eve. It was not good, God said, for the man to be alone in order for him to fulfill his purpose in the world and for his own well-being, he needed an equal partner and complementary companion. And so God made a woman and as the father of the bride brought her to the man. And when he saw her, Adam suddenly became a poet. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. How striking that the first human words recorded in history are expressed in the form of a love song, which the Bible immediately places in the context of marriage because the next verse says, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Forsaking all other human relationships, including that precious parental bond which brought the first person into the world, both husband and wife are bound together in an exclusive union, bound by the promises of abiding love. 
We are perhaps so familiar with this passage that sometimes we fail to see how astonishing it is. The Bible begins with the, the grand story of creation, God at work making a universe. Light shines into darkness. Stars are scattered across immensities of space. Galaxies spin into place. And then against the vast backdrop of the cosmos, consecrated for the worship of God, we are introduced to one man and one woman who are joined in one marriage. Surely that is so insignificant that it is utterly beneath anyone's notice in the universe unless, unless somehow their mutual love relationship is at the very heart of what God is doing in that entire universe. And so it is that in some mysterious way with the union of these two, the curtain rises on the redemptive purposes of God. And what we discover as the story unfolds is that the one flesh relationship of Adam and Eve is the divinely ordained pattern for marriage and also one of the Bible's primary pictures for God's relationship to his people. The prophet Isaiah said it as simply and as directly as he could. Your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. Similarly, in the book of Jeremiah, God styles himself as Israel's husband going back to the time of the Exodus. And if you think about it, that comparison makes sense on many levels. So many things that divine and human marriage share in common, both relationships based on love. And so husbands and wives have mutual ties of intimate affection. And God also is in love with us and, and we are in love with him or, or so we ought to be. Both relationships are bound by promises. Human marriage properly is understood as a covenant. That's why a wedding has vows. And God also describes his relationship with us as a covenant, a covenant of everlasting love. We, we are betrothed to a God who says to us, I love you always, forever. Here's another similarity between these two marriages, both are meant to be exclusive, inviolable. There are bonds of intimacy, especially sexual intimacy, that husbands and wives should never share with anyone else. And in the same way, God rightly claims all of our honor, all of our affection, all of our worship. And when he says, you shall have no other gods before me, he might as well be saying this, Repeat after me, I, believer, take thee, Yahweh, to be my lawful wedded husband. The exclus exclusivity of this relationship explains why it is right and good for God to be jealous. That sounds like a bad word to us, but when it comes to marriage, jealousy has its place. God says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. He's taking the part of a faithful husband who longs for his wife's loving embrace and thus refuses to share that love with anyone else. The whole Old Testament is the story of an exclusive love in which God styles himself as the husband of his people. And then we turn the page to Matthew. And in the New Testament, suddenly the groom walks into the room. It is Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, also called the Christ. And so when John the Baptist, who is given that calling of being the herald of the Messiah, introduces the Christ to us and he explains who he is in relationship to Jesus, he calls himself the friend of the bridegroom, the one who rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. And that makes Jesus the bridegroom. And as the story unfolds, we see him as the one who gives himself to the bride and often using that same imagery to explain his saving work. He compares his kingdom to a king who throws a wedding feast for his son or to maidens who are waiting expectantly to meet the groom. That's what the kingdom of Jesus Christ is like. 
And later when the Apostle Paul wanted to explain what exactly it was that Jesus had done to save his people, he said it was like a, a husband who loved his wife so much that he gave himself up for her. And by that reasoning, the cross is an expression of matrimonial affection. It is the sacrificial love of a doting husband for a beloved bride. And so this marriage is not some superficial metaphor. It's a fundamental reality introduced at the beginning of the world and lying close to the heart of the gospel. A faithful marriage is the gospel made visible to the watching world. And if we were to, tra to trace the trajectory of this love story all the way to the end, which I, I hope to do by the end of the year, we end up with a match made in heaven at the last of all weddings when a bride adorned for her husband comes down from heaven to become the wife of the lamb. Think of the Bible this way. It begins with a blind date and it ends with a wedding reception. A blind date at which Adam opens his eyes to see Eve and a wedding reception where you get to dance with the Son of God. That's the story of redemption in a nutshell. And that is the relationship that God wants to have with each of us, like the mutual affection of a man and a woman so deeply in love that they promise not to love anyone else but to stay together for the rest of their lives. That is why Adam and Eve were there at the beginning. That is why the Bible says that marriage should be held in honor by all. We were always meant to be what the Apostle Paul in Corinthians describes as a pure bride for one husband. Oh, I wish I could tell you that in the romance of our redemption, we have always had a perfect relationship, but we haven't. It is sad to say, but the majority of the passages in the Old Testament that use marital imagery to describe our relationship with God are all about marital failure. Again and again, God accuses his people of being unfaithful, of committing spiritual adultery, of quote unquote, playing the harlot, of sleeping with other gods in every public square and under every green tree. Let me just give you a couple examples of the way the Bible talks about this. What happens in Jeremiah 2 and 3, I think, is especially shocking. Do you know that in those chapters, God actually files for divorce from his people? If you look at the language in the chapter, he's giving legal testimony before a jury, and he, he starts by going back to the beginning of the relationship when Israel was young and in love. I remember the devotion of your youth. He says on the witness stand, your love as a bride, that was then, this is now. And Israel is guilty of the great sin of spiritual adultery. And so God files a covenant lawsuit. I contend with you, he says. And then he brings evidence after evidence of his people's unfaithfulness. One, one image is especially disturbing. God compares his people I'm quoting here from Jeremiah 2, to a wild donkey used to the wilderness in her heat, sniffing the wind. Who can restrain her lust? None who seek her need weary themselves. In her month, they will find her. It's a way of saying that God's people have such a voracious appetite for worshiping other gods. They are like a donkey in heat, sniffing the wind to find yet another partner. That is what it is like when we say that Jesus isn't enough for us, when we turn away from the one true God and run to money or sex or power or control, when cynicism and criticism and all of the other, other idols that want to seduce us come to have control. And one of the things that makes this sexually charged imagery so apt is that Canaanite religion, such as Israel was often tempted to practice, was often characterized by ritual prostitution. People went to hilltop shrines of the pagan gods, not only to worship, but on occasion to have intercourse. 
And so the Bible, how graphically it speaks about these things. And Jeremiah, you have played the whore with many lovers. Lift up your eyes to the bare heights and see where have you not been ravished? The whole land is polluted. We find similar imagery in the book of Hosea. Here's another example. It begins with what surely must be the strangest command that God ever gave to one of his prophets. He told Hosea to marry a prostitute. Why on earth? God wanted to give Israel a living object lesson of spiritual unfaithfulness. So he said to Hosea, go, take a, take a prostitute for your wife, have children with her, for the whole land is committing prostitution by forsaking the Lord. The point was that Israel was like Hosea's wife, Gomer, although he was a faithful husband, she wanted to be with other lovers. You see, Jeremiah one and Hosea both wanted people to see how serious sin is. They, they took the most exclusive, most pure relationship, the relationship of marriage, and then thought about what it was like when that relationship was violated. And they wanted us to see that's how much damage is done to our love relationship with the living God when we give ourselves to other gods. Every sin is a kind of spiritual adultery. And so when we are proud of our intellectual accomplishments, perhaps, or worry about things that God tells us not to worry about, or when we minimize others a little bit and maximize ourselves a little bit more, or when we depend on our own strength instead of acknowledging our weakness, or whenever we commit any other sin, all of that is unfaithfulness to God. In every case, we're choosing to love, not to love him, but to love someone or something else instead, which is really a way of cheating on our divine spouse. That's the way the Bible looks at it. But now here is where the story gets truly amazing, because you would think that someone in God's position and I, you've, some of you have heard me say this before. I love the way that Tim Keller talks about God's relationship with his people. He says, here's God. He's trapped in the longest bad marriage in history. If you were in that relationship and had to put up with repeated unfaithfulness, why would you stay in the relationship if, there's a, if you're connected to a virgin bride and she becomes a brazen prostitute, then obviously you would go through with the divorce, right? except that God doesn't. What he does instead is he comes back to us again and again and again as an ardent lover, never discouraged, always wanting tenderly to win back our love. He comes with a grace so powerful in that love relationship that he cleanses our sin and makes us pure again. A moment ago, I referred to that wild donkey in, Jer in Jeremiah, sniffing the wind for another partner. Later in Jeremiah, God uses a very different image for his people. And when you see the whole story, you're amazed by what the image is because he says of Israel, now you are a virgin. Humanly speaking, once you lose your virginity, you never get it back. But the sanctifying power of God's forgiveness restores us to perfect purity. Not anything that we have done, only what God can do. Here is what God says in Jeremiah 31. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. I, again, I will build you and you shall be built. O virgin Israel. Even when we do not love God faithfully. He still faithfully loves us. One theologian comments that in the Bible, we have to reckon with the unfaithfulness of the wife, but never with the unfaithfulness of the husband. This is displayed perhaps most graphically in the book of Hosea. The prophet marries the prostitute. She goes out and does what prostitutes do. She pursues other lovers. And again, Hosea uses the, the, the sexual imagery in combination with the spiritual imagery to give us this picture. And then he tells Hosea to go out and find that woman and bring her back home. Go again, love a woman who's an adulteress, even as the Lord loves Israel, though they turn to other gods. 
We get the impression that by this point, the woman has been sold into slavery because in order to bring her back home again, Hosea has to buy her back. In fact, the Bible tells the auction price, 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethic of barley. Gomer was sold to the highest bidder, which turned out to be the husband that she once betrayed. Imagine paying the price for someone else's spiritual adultery. But then that is what this love story is all about. Look at Christ on the cross and count the cost of your redemption. On Calvary, the bridegroom was paying the bride price. It was a wounded lover who was pierced for our transgressions, dying to win us back to his love. And so if you find honestly that you've been unfaithful, and really, is there a sin we have not committed? Pride, jealousy, slander, selfish ambition, lust, adultery, greed, racism, anger, every form of idolatry, every sin, a form of spiritual unfaithfulness to the Son of God. We're so unfaithful, but he nevertheless loves us with an everlasting love. Therefore, he continues his faithfulness to us. Jesus Christ is the loving groom who welcomes us into his arms and says, I love you always, forever. The bridegroom rejoices over the bride. Even after everything we have done, we are still the beloved. So love accordingly. Our Father in heaven, we give you praise for the gift of your loving grace in Jesus Christ, utterly pure, absolutely faithful, so completely unlike everything we offer to you. Cleanse us and make us pure and give us a pure love for our beloved Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.